as soon as you get a novel style of attack that has been successful in this stage, your every government around the world will be sitting going, um, right, let's add another piece into our contingency plans to make sure that we're looking for this and all the rest of it. You know, the, the initial reports coming out to say that it was a cyber type attack that um, caused the lithium batteries to superheat and then explode. You know, if we, if we extrapolate that out, um, that would mean that no no airline would ever take anyone with any mobile communication device on the aircraft ever, and there would there would have been an instant worldwide ban. So, you know, there, there's a potential for panic with this uh, around around the world, and governments will be asking you know their airports and other places if the um, X ray machines and the other scanning machines that are used w would be able to pick up these sorts of things. So they'll they'll want to understand the the technology behind it. Um, yes, it will have people thinking and thinking hard about um, wider security issues. You know, the businesses will be looking at it one to make sure that they can identify if anything like this happens. You know, it, it will come out in public. Um, who the shippers were, where it's been moved, where, where they were manufactured, um, and all the rest of that. That will that will start to slowly creep out. The reputational damage that that will do for those um, shippers uh, will be catastrophic. I suspect it might put them out of business completely, um, because you know, no one's going to use that shipping company um, if they can't control uh, and keep security over goods that are in transit. Um, so I think you know every. Yeah. Private company that's involved in this somehow or other will be sitting and looking at you know, what they have in place to monitor what's uh, what's going on. Um, you know, there'll be lots of doors being closed, stable doors being closed after the horse is bolted. A terror group could do, probably not with the same sort of volume, but um, it certainly could do with the with a smaller number of devices um, or, or other things that that they put around the place. You know, they they, they sort of tampering with something that looks like an everyday object that people are using and, and using that to then have a, an effect, whether that's a physical effect or a cyber effect, is not uncommon. You know, we look at the Stuxnet attack against the Iranian, um, uh, uh, the Iranian uranium centrifuges. Try saying that if you've had a glass or two. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they were isolated from the internet, um, but you, you the Americans or the Americans and Israelis or the Israelis managed to get this virus across the air gap and in. And they did that by um, you know, altering um, USB sticks and scattering them around the place. And someone picked one up, took it into the office and plugged it into the machine. That is not uncommon. Um, it's not uncommon for um, nation states and, and potentially large criminal slash terror organizations to get spyware onto people's phones uh, where they can turn the... Uh, microphone on the camera on and you you don't know what getting slightly more sophisticated getting explosives in because that will have had to been designed manufactured brought in in a way where you know, the, the the devices could be disassembled quickly um put uh, the, the, these items put in and reassembled, knowing that they're going to work normally. There'd be nothing suspicious about it whatsoever. Uh, you know, the packaging would seem as if it had been done. So get them properly repackaged takes takes a lot of resources. But a large number of our criminal organisations and a large number of our terror organisations, um, you have the potential capacity to do that sort of thing. It's counterintelligence officers across the world will be looking at it um, from a security perspective, you know, examining um, you know, different different uh, tenders that have gone out for different pieces of equipment, looking at the supply chains that are coming through there, making an assessment against those supply chains as to the potential for things to be um, interfered with. That's done already in many cases where things are coming into the military, um, you know, nation states, um, so that you people are are. Um, confident that they haven't been tampered with from an electronic perspective or anything else. So you know, there, there, there are ways and means of doing it. Um, it will just redouble people's efforts into making sure that they are you know, crossing their T's and dotting their I's properly whenever they're looking at this. Uh, the challenge is going to be the, the quantity of the improvised explosive devices that are out there. Uh, the, the system's designed to detect explosives, and it does a pretty good job of doing that insofar as we know. We haven't had major aviation attack in a long time, uh, fingers crossed. But the you put so many into a system, and it just increases your chances of something getting through. Uh, it's 
it really becomes a numbers game at that point. So, you know, even the best of technology uh, and the best detector personnel out there, you put enough stuff through a lot of different areas at one point in time, uh, something is, is frankly bound to get through, I would imagine. We don't know how many we're missing. Uh, the, the more we detect, the more we can presume that, okay, there's been misses in the past. We know that things get missed. There's no 100% detection. But it's hard to know how much you don't catch. So it's kind of like trying to determine how often someone doesn't break into your house because of a certain security measure you took. Uh, the, the bad guys just don't call us later and say, hey, I got this through. You should have done a better job. There's certain cybersecurity protections in place. But from receiving a standard signal, if you have Wi-Fi in the aircraft, you're going to receive that signal from the ground. Uh, there's technology in the plane itself, which allows it to communicate with the tower, you know, the cell towers on the ground. And it basically sort of uh, modifies the signal so that the aircraft can receive it on a consistent basis. Otherwise, the thing hops from cell tower to cell tower uh, trying to hold on to a signal, which is why we traditionally haven't been able to use Wi-Fi. Now we have this technology. And I just saw that one airline out here has got a contract with Starlink to uh, start using the, the Elon Musk satellite system. So there's anytime there's going to be any form of communication uh, through radio frequencies from one point to another, there's always the possibility something can be sent along those radio frequencies. So I know when I travel, sometimes I'll use Wi-Fi, but a lot of times I'll just turn on the messaging, which means my phone can still send and receive messages. So it's in, unless there's some cybersecurity protection in place, along certain frequencies uh, that would somehow pre prevent that, uh, which which could be very difficult because I would imagine in this case, qualifying that I'm not the cybersecurity or the radio frequency excerpt expert, but they probably sent a certain signal out to call back a certain number and that was what triggered the, the, the particular devices. And so through that coding of what they're sending out, uh, is the thing that actually triggered the device. The real question remains, too, is, is there enough explosives that you can put into a cell phone or a pager um, that would actually cause enough damage to penetrate the skin of an aircraft? And that, that gets into a whole other discussion as to the quantity of explosives. Are they above 10,000 feet, which the aircraft starts to pressurize? Um, are they placed next to the fuselage itself where the uh, where the window is. So there's a lot of those dynamics that you have to take into account as well. We provide a high level of deterrence. Uh, there's never going to be 100% secure. Uh, the only way to prevent attacks on aviation is to not fly. Once you start flying, you introduce safety and security risks. There's always going to be an element of risk in aviation transportation, just as there is in ground transportation. So that element of risk is there, but we still have the safest aviation industry. Uh, it really is, we haven't had a major aviation accident in a long time. Um, it's still considered the safest form of travel. And... You know, there's kind of a saying in our industry, you're more likely to get in a car accident on the way to the airport or on the way home than you are getting into a plane crash. Um, that said, I've been in a plane crash so uh, it was of a small airplane. So, yeah, stuff can happen, but the uh, the chances of it are so minuscule uh, that it's not something that a lot of people really should worry about, even though it's a justifiable justifiable worry because... We don't like things out of our control. And when you're in a car, you feel some sense of control because you have a steering wheel in front of you. Uh, when you're in an airplane, you have no control. You're in a metal tube, 35,000 feet, pressurized, going 600 miles an hour. And that can be a scary thing for, for anybody. So I don't think the anxiety of flying is ever going to go away for everyone. But by and large, I think most people are, are going to make their flights no problem uh, from beginning to end. Like over the states, any given time during the day, we've got about 5,000 aircraft flying around that are in civil aviation, uh, not even counting our general aviation fleets. And they get to their destinations just fine. 
on a daily basis. And that's, that's a lot of planes on a daily basis to, uh, to be able to make their destination without any sort of huge safety related problem.